for harmony in the world, for peace and security, we need to give access to the 1.4 billion people who have no access to electricity. Relying on biomass, firewood, cow dung to cook, it's causing 2 million deaths a year, much more than malaria or HIV AIDS. Energy is the golden thread that runs across all the pillars of sustainable development. Africa is a rich continent. Its flora and fauna, its people, its resources. But Africa does have its challenges. Infrastructure, security, energy. Energy is the golden thread that runs across all the pillars of sustainable development. This last item is the concern of Kandayum Keller, man of energy. Without sustainable energy, you can't have sustainable growth. Kandayum Keller is a man on a mission. He wants everyone in Africa to enjoy access to clean and affordable energy. Whether they live in rural Rwanda or his own home village on Sierra Leone's north coast. With access to energy, Yumkela hopes that people can enjoy the same success in life as he has. A career that has put him at a major American university his own country's government, and an important positions with the United Nations. For harmony in the world, for peace and security, we need to give access to the 1.4 billion people who have no access to electricity. We need to help the 2.7 billion who are relying on biomass for cooking in the 21st century. That's, that's what about one third of mankind relying on biomass, firewood, cow dung, to cook and it's causing two million deaths a year much more than malaria or hiv aids and most some of them i look at it and say that's either my aunt or my sister recently kande went home to his village in kichom in the far northeast corner of sierra leone that's my brother <laughs> that's my uncle <laughs> and that's my chief <laughs> Also my uncle. Yes. It's a sign how much the people of this fishing village revere the boy who grew up to become a respected academic, government minister, and then head of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Yimkela's home village remains his inspiration. By staying in touch with his family and the people here, Yimkela sees what impact he can have with his work and just how much there is still to do. This is where I was born, Kichom. About 2,500 people here. This is a, an, an, an interesting case study because uh, the village is right on the estuary of one of the biggest rivers in Sierra Leone. And it's at the point where it empties into the Atlantic. And so when we talk about sea level rising as a result of climate change, these people could pay a heavy price. In fact, one of our main uh, population areas that is a fishing village, Yeliboya, is already being consumed. His concern for and love of his village evident as he takes stock of Kichom's current situation. 
But in addition, this is a village that is very poor. It's agrarian. And what they rely on here is rice cultivation, one of the largest rice cultivating areas in the country. But they also have no electricity. So what we've done through UNIDO and with the technical guidance of uh, Dr. Keleman who holds a PhD, we're trying to do integrated energy solutions. They call it lighting a billion lives, giving basic solar technology to uh, households so they can have light at night, so that children can read, so women have a few more hours to finish whatever productive work they've been doing during the day. Here we charge 50 lamps. Okay, watch your steps. Time? As you can see, we have less than 50 lamps here, because in the five shelves, each shelf takes about 10 lamps. Kichum wouldn't appear to offer the kinds of opportunities that Chumkela was presented. People here are lucky to make it as far as Freetown, the country's capital. Yumkela's own father was a farmer, albeit one with boundless energy and ambition. He was also chief of the village, a parliamentarian and a great role model for his son. He made sure Yumkela got a superior education, splitting his time between Kichum and Freetown. In the capital, despite occasional power outages, Yumkela had a more regular supply of electric light to study by. I lived two lives. I had a rich suburban li livelihood in, in Freetown, but every holiday my father would bring us here, and he wanted us to live like the people. And for me, it was probably the best education because I can blend all worlds. But then I put things in perspective, and that was his argument. I don't want you to believe that what I earned is yours. Find your own. So he'll deliberately deprive us, and I have to spend holidays here rather be in free time watching TV at that age. That's my father's grave. My dad taught me competitiveness and hard work. Um, you can see this, the hips here where we do vegetables. So as, at a very young age, six, seven already, my dad had me working with people doing gardening. And to do the garden, you have first have to get rid of the weeds. So he'll plot deliberately that I'm given a little slightly bigger portion than the other kids. And some of them were older than me, and he didn't want me to slack off. I wasn't happy about it, but... Uh, and he would supervise sometimes. So yes, he was a hard driver. I think to a great extent my drive, and people say, oh, how come you never get tired and you have seven balls in the air driving things? That's from him. <laughs> While his father's position in the community and as a national parliamentarian provided young Mumkela with certain advantages, it also presented danger. His papa's pro-civilian, anti-military stand led to a harrowing experience. At age eight, the young Mumkela was held hostage for several hours by a group of paramilitary looking for his father. By 1965, he owned the largest private plantation in the country. By hard knocks, one square mile, he had 150 heads of cattle. He was doing fishing. He owned real estates in the capital. And he, then he joined politics full time. So he was a founding member of a political party and all of that. So when he looks at me, he said, with all your PhD, what can you do? You guys just read books and write stuff. If you want to really make a difference, go down and work with the people. As he reflects on the advantages his father gave him, he is staring at the challenges Kichum presents to this generation of youngsters. And you'll see this evening in two hours when the sun goes down, the village shuts down. So by seven o'clock, everybody's indoors, or they're sitting on the veranda. Give them another hour, they go home. That's three, four, five hours of productive life gone. The kids, no electricity to study. That's worse. I had two lives. I can come on holidays two weeks and go to Freetown and have good education. They're stuck here. So that deprivation, without energy, your life shuts down at seven o'clock. 
And it's not just the youth that he sees being challenged by the lack of energy. The people walk seven, eight kilometers to go to their farms. On the way back home, you can see women carrying wood on their head, maybe with a child on their back. Ah, if they've not collected water from the well, they go back and collect water. So think about it. With energy, you can pump the water. With energy, they don't have to collect the wood or cut the forest. They have energy at home. My home here does not have. So I live and preach uh, what I know. And I believe it's the same for 1.4 billion people around the world. After finishing university in Sierra Leone, where he majored in agriculture, Yumkele left this environment for a trip across the Atlantic Ocean. He was 23. He chose Cornell University in the United States. At Cornell, electricity was available night and day. Continuing his studies of agriculture, he was introduced to many new ideas. In the United States, I was lucky that I was trained within what they call the land-grant system. In the land-grant agricultural universities, Cornell, Illinois, Michigan State, our job was to do analysis to benefit rural farming communities. So whatever analysis we did, the question the, we, we had to answer is, so what does it mean for the farmers? What does it mean for the agribusiness community? Ah, and that rural economy. Like his father, Junkela will always be a farmer, even later when he went from student to teacher. The university was happy to have me, because in the agricultural or international development classes, they were happy to have somebody on the faculty that had seen it firsthand. But in between his transition from student to teacher, the devotion to his country called him home. After a decade in the U.S., Junkela answered a call to come back to Sierra Leone and serve as a government minister during the war. <laughs> President Joseph Mama's government was attacked by the paramilitary Revolution United Front. They were backed by the Liberian warlord Charles Taylor, who was later taken to the International Criminal Court for his war crimes, including actions committed in Sierra Leone. The Civil War was to last more than a decade. It was a dangerous time. It was sad because I, I know we were called the Athens of Africa and suddenly the only statistic people remembered about us was the ravages of war, the cutting of people's limbs. Uh, but it was good for me to be home and see the devastation and talk to market women and see blood on the bags of rice when trucks were ambushed by rebels or some other people. Um, I remember flying into the southern province when the rebels had cut off the road and nobody would go in. Five of us ministers said we will go back there because that's where I went to school. So we flew in by helicopter. Yumkela so attacked his new position with the usual frantic energy. Despite the conflict, Junkela was determined to use his education to improve his nation. I used to teach food policy. What do you do about the price of rice? How do you do rice trading? Here in Sierra Leone, I had to manage rice policy uh, uh, here. I, had to, I managed all the most sensitive communities, rice, flour, sugar, petrol. And they were always scarce. How do you ration? In, in the classroom, I can draw the graphs of supply and demand. Here, I have to address it real time. While facing these challenges, Junkela was struck by one huge disparity between his educational host country, the U.S., and his own. It was shocking for me to come back to Sierra Leone after 11 years in the United States. And sometimes as minister, study with, do my work with candlelight because I used to stay in the office late. I go home, didn't have a generator. Well, my, my dear friend, I, I, I was in top universities in the States to come back. But that also gave me the reality and walking into the little factories to say without energy, an economy cannot be competitive. 
With the conflict still ongoing, Yumkela felt his impact to be limited. After a year and a half, he left the government and returned to the U.S., this time as a teacher. I resigned, went back straight to the classroom. Two weeks later, I was teaching, but I felt like a free man. That's what academia does for you. You think freely, because we had what we called academic freedom. While he felt good to be back at school, he looks at his government service as educational as well. It was good experience, and I tell you, my year and a half in Sierra Leone, in those difficult circumstances, probably was just as good as my six years trying to get a PhD. But academic life did not last long, and Yumkela moved again, this time to the United Nation in New York. It was 1996, just three and a half years after leaving his government position in Freetown. Here, he spent the next two decades rising through the ranks before eventually becoming Director General of UNIDO. I joined the United Nations in 1996. It was a different culture. Here, they were not interested in how many papers you had reviewed. They were interested in simple policy language. What does it mean uh, uh, for the guy who is not a, an economist? So it took a while to learn the language of the UN, to learn the style of the UN. But I can tell you this, still today, 17 and a half years in the UN, people see me, I have never really behaved as a typical bureaucrat. On the one hand, I facilitate discussions. I don't sit at a table. My staff know that the thing I hate in a meeting is to sit in one place talking down to people. I interact. That's from academia. That's what I learned as a teacher. At UNIDO, Yumkela has been the driving force in many power projects around the world. In Rwanda, a lack of electricity in remote rural areas of the mountainous country is hampering development plans. It's estimated that only 6% of the Rwandan population has access to electricity. Thanks to UNIDO, the country is now pioneering the construction of small-scale hydroelectric projects as an affordable and green solution to the problem. In Kabere in the country's north, for example, it's now easier for the local health clinic to store medicine at the right temperature and sterilize equipment more efficiently. Open your computers, okay? Open your compu computers. And in education, electricity has set learning alight. The 1,600 children at Kitabura School have been selected to take part in the One Child, One Laptop program. These children are learning new skills, skills useful for the 21st century. Puisque nous avons l'électricité, la qualité de l'éducation sera améliorée, puisque notre élève aura accès à l'internet. Comme ça, nous allons avec la technologie d'aujourd'hui. Previously, we thought we would take electricity where demand is. But we have realized that when we take electricity there, we create the demand. So where we have managed to connect electricity, where we have managed to put those mini hydros, lives of the people have changed significantly. You could see people started putting some saloons, hair saloons, uh, small industries. They have started... Uh, I mean, they understood now what is having electricity. And then they have created that demand. In the other areas, we have some places where people have joined their hands. They have put the money together. Now they are requesting to be to put the plants, uh, the hydropower plants, in their villages. Back home, Yumkela wants to bring the benefits of many hydro projects to Sierra Leoneans too. A project on the Bankosoka River was developed by UNIDO with construction being undertaken by a Chinese firm. 
Six years ago, UNIDO identified this site as a potential location for a mini hydro. At that time, we were looking at the possibility of generating one megawatt of renewable energy power to supply the hospital. One of our regional hospitals is in this town, but it's a major agricultural area as well. Over the years, as they've been looking at the engineering study, they realized that this has a potential for three megawatts or more. They've studied the water flow over different periods of the season over the years. And as you can see, this is the dry season and you can hear the water and you can see the water flow. Where these rivers are, you also find a number of uh, social services like schools, universities, colleges, health centers, hospitals that go without, without energy, but that need energy. So if we have them localized, like the Bank of Soka case, then it will serve that community well in these areas that I've just mentioned. And the people also need energy even for their own livelihood. So I see that having these small units of uh, small units of, um, of hydropower um, stations uh, will go a long way in, in, in addressing our energy deficiencies in the country as a whole. Working with partner organization, Yumkela has helped to support innovative projects in the field of solar power. Some of the time when you have too much rain, the normal solar panel does not take, but this one, regardless of charge. the weather, yes, it right. charges all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. When you put a water and 12 volts, don't... The Barefoot College in Sierra Leone enrolls illiterate and semi-literate women and trains them in solar engineering. The women used to be subsistence farmers, but now earn a living assembling household solar units in Port Loco district. Uh, These solar suitcases provide light for the community health workers as they travel in the region with no regular electricity supply. The solar light is much more powerful than light produced by mobile phones. Yumkela is worried that the village like his own will become ghost towns as their young people migrate to cities where they have access to energy and the benefits it brings. The African population should hit 1.4 billion by 2030. We already estimate in the UN by 2025-2030 over 60-70% of that will be urbanized. You see in Freetown, the people are leaving and coming into the city even though it doesn't have regular electricity. Why? It's better to move to the capital than to stay in my village. You saw my village and you saw the number of children. And a lot of these populations in Africa are very young. They vote with their feet. I, say, I try to convince African leaders that look to generate jobs and to ensure that in fact you have other population centers, not only the capital, you need to have facilities, infrastructure, energy systems in rural areas. Yes. Uh, okay. okay, sir, if, we, we, if any chance you give me a number, I will call them. So it's about change and it's about possibilities that it can happen. It can happen and people's lives can be better. I hope I make a difference. We need to assure every Sierra Leonean, every person in Samu or Kicham that yes, you can switch the light on. But if you cannot, you can have a solar lantern. You don't have to live in darkness. We can give the women cook stoves that are more efficient to reduce that indoor air pollution that kills them every day. Or in fact, make their children have extra light to study. Their classrooms, there's a library. Somewhere they get knowledge. They break away from poverty. What I said to my people this afternoon, as you heard, say, I'm just demonstrating here what I'm preaching globally. I think it would be hypocritical of me to do all of these around the world. And people say, wait a minute, but what happened to your village in this process?
Yunkela passionately believes that Africa, with the right leaders, can create wealth for its people. My hope is my biggest impact would be to tell Sierra Leonean children and people that you can be ten times better than you are. That in fact, with the natural resources God has given us now, one of the largest exporters of iron ore soon, an oil exporting country in three years time, that you know we have no reason being poor. In 10, 15 years we should be better. And if we are not, hold your governments accountable. He encourages foreign investors to come to Africa and Africans to make sure they benefit from this investment. The companies did not come here to exploit you. They want to do business. They want your country stable. That's the way they make money. It's win-win. It is up to your leadership, community, and government, and civic, to make sure that your rights are protected, to make sure that the prosperity of your children, intergenerational prosperity, is sustained. Perhaps more than energy, Yumkela's real lasting legacy might be to remind people just how high it's possible for a boy from a small village to rise. For me, I believe my biggest impact might be to give my people hope about possibility, about benefits, that they can be better than they are. Because why? Thanks to the education here, thanks to good family upbringing and our traditions, I have reached the highest level than any Sierra Leonean so far in the global multilateral system. If it were not for people who gave me opportunity, coming from the village I came from, 250 poor households, till about age four or five, I'll never be where I am. I always say, some of what I do now is about my kids and our grandchildren, that they don't become economic refugees like I was. I could not come back home because there was war. I could not come back home because there was no real jobs. But I am convinced today, with resources we have, that our children can finish their studies and come home here if we encourage private sector investment, that this economy will be big enough to employ them and perhaps will be the model for the rest of Africa.